So there were a number of scripture stories, obviously, that we covered in PBS. We're not going to read all of them, though. I do commend all of them to you. But we will read one from the Gospel according to Luke. But before we read from God's Word, let us ask for God's help to understand. Let us pray. God, you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear your word. Let us now see and hear the scriptures written before us and open our hearts to understand the power of you in the Amen. Again, this is from Luke chapter 2. This is beginning with verse 41. Jesus causes both marvel and panic. Questions and even more questions in this temple episode. Listen closely for God's word to be solved. So each year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to their custom. After the festival was over, they were returning home, but the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't know it. Supposing that he was among their band of travelers, they journeyed on for a full day while looking for him among their family and friends. When they didn't find Jesus, they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. Now, after three days, they found him in the temple. He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and putting questions to them. Everyone who heard him was amazed by his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were shocked. His mother said, Child! Why have you treated us like this? Listen, your father and I have been worried. We've been looking for you. Jesus replies, why are you looking for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? But they didn't understand what he said to them. Jesus went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. His mother cherished every word in her heart. Jesus matured in wisdom and years and in favor with God and with people. The word of the Lord. Let me invite all of my PBS participants to come forward. Courage. That's right. How do you do courage? 
Mr. Shoemaker? Yeah. And then the third story we talked about was, do you remember? Wisdom. Yeah, the one we just read, Jesus in the temple. Wisdom, right? How do you do wisdom? All right. One would hope, right? One would hope it's here. So <laughs> one of the things that we did, as we already said, is we sung some songs, didn't we? So today we're going to do one for, we're going to do a couple of congregations, but first we're going to do Everlasting God. Do you remember that one? Yeah. And we're going to ask our friend, um, Ms. Jane, to come and to help us with the motion. Take away.
which is a little strange. But before we dig any further into that, let's talk a little bit <coughs> about heroes. What, um, what does it mean to be a hero? Or even a superhero? What does it mean? I mean, is it the way you're dressed? Do you have to wear spandex in order to be a superhero? <laughs> Do you have to be in some goofy costume or have some name like Warlock or Wonder Woman or Superman in order to be a, a hero? Is that what it is? Do you have to have some kind of ability? It would help. <laughs> but do you have to have some kind of ability? Is that it? Um, some people, uh, I, I asked some people to share what, what superpower would they want to have? Um, and, and one person said that they wish that they could be in someone's presence and whenever they're around them, they have to say the truth, no matter what, all the time. When they're around them. Can you imagine? Somebody else said that they wish that they could fly. Largely because they feel like they're late to everything and they feel like flying would help them to kind of cut to the chase. Um, some people said that they wish that they had um, the ability to heal. Can you imagine? And then they said they wish they had the ability to make the lottery do what they wanted. <laughs> but, you know, all of these things kind of come out of, these ideas, don't they come out of people's needs? The things that they perceive that they really want to have, that they wish they could have to, in order to manipulate whatever situation they find themselves in. And, and we have this sense that being super um, isn't so much about who we are, but what we can do. And, and that's just not true. <coughs> I mean, as Christian people, it's very important who we are. And God tells us so. Um, and it begins with the story that they, um, that they started with. This is, of course, a story that may be familiar to us. It's the anointing of David out of um, 1 Samuel 16. And um, there's a lot going on in the story, but... As you can see there in the background, David's brothers are standing there watching all this unfold. And God went through all of them until he got to the youngest, to David. And David was the one that was picked. And you can imagine, they probably were seething with a little jealousy. But the truth is, if they had any idea what was coming, none of them would have wanted the job. Who would want to be the king? To be responsible for the spiritual and leadership of the people for the military protection of the nation. And by the way, you've got to live up to God's standards all the time. Anybody signing up for that? And yet, here's David with a heart for God who decides that yes, his answer should be yes. And, and the thing is, in a way, he's a little too young to know that he should probably say no. All he understands is that God has come through with, for him so he ought to come through for God. I mean, it's the logic that a child would employ. Because children tend to be pretty stark about things. Especially when they're young. Everything is kind of absolute. I want it now. I don't want to go to sleep. And so on. It's always absolute. And the same thing is true when it comes to stuff like this. It's no wonder God wants us to have childlike faith. And then there's this story out of 1 Samuel 25. How many of you are familiar with Abigail? Yeah, it, 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 it can feel pretty obscure unless you spend time really reading it, like say in Bible school or in Sunday school, or otherwise just studying it. But it's, it's a neat story um, about King, at this point David's um, kind of roving around with this band, um, protecting the people and... and um, um, coming close to the time where he's going to be announced as the actual king. And while he's been doing this, he actually protected this guy named Nabal and his stuff. Um, he did it for nothing. He didn't ask for anything in return. But they were coming back into the area, and he sent word to Nabal, hey, listen, we're coming through. We're kind of tired. You know, what do you say you can give us a few loaves of bread and, and hook us up with some of the drain? Um, we're, we're pretty wiped out. And Nabal said, I don't owe you anything. He can just forget it. And he was, he was really nasty about it. And David said, well, we can fish your little red wagon. And so they got their swords and everything together. And they were going to teach them some manners. And Abigail got word about this and said, okay, my husband's an idiot. 
And so she went and she packed horses with provisions and she got her service together and she went out and met David on his way to take care of business with Nabal and said, look, my husband's fool. His name means fool, Nabal. Did you know that? It does. And they're explicit about it in, this, in the text. And Abigail said, look, don't do what you were thinking to do. Just take this stuff and, and just call it even. And David said, you know, your husband doesn't deserve you. All right, we'll back off. And they did. And then later, Nabal um, died. In fact, I think it says that he died, um, he got struck, which probably means he had a heart attack. And um, when David got word about that, he called on Abigail to become his wife, um, among many, I might add. But the point is, Abigail's courage um, saved two men from doing something precipitous. And her courage also gave her um, blessings and provision in her own life. And these two are things that God wants us to bear out as heroes for God. And then there's the story that we read today, the story of the temple um, and Jesus being lost but questioning the leaders who were there. And i got to ask, how many of you parents um, would have yelled at Jesus? Really? I yelled at I would have. And, and I mean, how many of you would have been good with his answer? I mean, he almost kind of sound kind of smart out to in a way. I mean, they're saying, how can you do this to us? We're worried about you. We've been looking for you. Why are you looking for me? Really? If I had talked to my mom that way? Mm -hmm. And so you have this sense that the, the story um, is leaving out pieces. Um, and, it, and it is. Um, and, and for some reason, we have this, this habit of wanting to treat Jesus and his humanity with these weird kid gloves um, or these gentle gloves instead of just taking it at face value, much like a child might. Um, one of the things that I found interesting um, to do was to go through and, and, and look at all of the different ways um, Mary and Joseph confronting Jesus looked. Um, and cool. And I'm going to show you that picture in a minute because I couldn't believe it. But you, you have this sense that it doesn't sound like Jesus is being particularly heroic here. But he is. Because Jesus is clear about who he is. Could he have handled the thing with his parents differently? Maybe. But the point of the story is to talk about who Jesus is. And that's why he's doing what he's doing. That's why he is where he is. And the same thing is true for us if we're going to call ourselves followers of Christ. That's why this temple encounter really in some ways is just like this one. Because when Jesus was clearing the temple, he wasn't doing it because he was showing off or because he felt like he had more power than anybody else there. He was doing it because of who he is. This part of the Bible story says... Um, quotes the Psalms where he says, your, the passion for your house just engulfs me, overwhelms me. It's who he is. So why are we so afraid to be who we are? You, can't, you might not be able to tell, but when I Googled Mary and Joseph upset with Jesus, all the pictures I got were of Mary and Joseph looking at Jesus and cuddling Jesus and looking at him in the manger. I mean, none of them look like my search terms. And I think the same thing is true if I use those search terms with us. We have this tendency not to think in terms of Jesus being like us, like God valuing us, who we are. We have this sense that we want to, uh, hear our heroes to be something bigger or something unreal. Something maybe even bordering on fake. And that's just not so. God wants us. God made us. God's not looking for us to wear capes and have a big symbol emblazoned on our chest. Certainly not to fly, because if that were true, guess what? We'd be flying. God's not looking for us um, to do more than we were born to do. Um, this movie on this remake of Wonder Woman is, is just blazing through our theaters right now. 
And one of the things that's remarkable to me about the way this particular movie was done was they didn't focus so much on her physicality, um, they didn't focus so much on some of the um, social norms that were going on around her. Her power came from her understanding of who she is, of who she is meant to be. And again, that same thing is true for us. It is. Whether we're talking about ourselves as individuals or we're talking about ourselves as the family of God, all of us has a role. All of us has the powers that God has granted to us to accomplish all that God really wants to, to accomplish. And it all takes place because of Christ's name. And consider these scriptures. Where two or three are gathered in my... Is that familiar to you? What about this one? At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. What about this one? Ask for anything in mind, and I will do it, he says in John. What about, but if you but believe on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. I love this one. But those who did welcome him, who believed in his, he authorized to become God's children. Born not from blood, or from human desire or passion, but born from God. So says John 1. You, we've got this sense, again, that we bear the name of Christ. And it makes all the difference. We can talk about all the things that we wish we were able to do, but the truth is we can do anything because we have the name of Christ. Philippians chapter 4 says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Did you know that? Maybe you remember it, but do you know it? More than a cape, spandex, or a utility belt, we have the very power that created the heavens and the earth. But it's not for us to wield so that God can wield us. It is. So what do we stand for? Our motto. What should our motto be? Well, it should be what our children learn in BBS. Psalm 34, verse 14. Turn away from evil, do good, seek peace, and go after it. That means sometimes, adults, we need to stop being so serious. We need to remember what it was like to play to relax, to let go every now and then, to stop having everything have the highest stakes, and to take God at face value, to take our faith at face value, to take ourselves at face value. We are every bit the superheroes that God wants us to be. We just have to know our name. We just need to know our name. In the name of the one who called us children. Amen. So what about it? be a hero in God's eyes? One of the things that fascinates us with superheroes is that they seem to be able to do anything. But again, isn't that really true of us? I mean, I think one of the reasons that God was, is, so, is so in love with us is because we are capable of anything. And so how do we use our powers for good? How do we act as the heroes that God wants? As the heroes that God wants. So with this in mind, please think and pray about the following this week. First, in what ways are you living up to the meaning of your name? In what ways are you living up to the meaning of your name? And second, when is the last time that you observed a child to see what they could teach you about faith? When's the last time? Third, what, what do you do to make room for children in our church? What do you personally do to make room for our children in our church? And fourth, 
would you say that you are a responsible user of the power that God has given you? What would you say? I mean, of course, what do you think it takes for you to be a hero? Are you using your own standards or are you using the standards that God has laid out? What does it take for you to be a hero? And, and then, what can anyone, and not just children, but what can anyone learn from your example in faith? What can anyone learn from your example? And next, how open are you to feedback? And be honest with yourself. You know, Samuel got corrected. You know, he was going to go, and, and he didn't want to annoy David. He was bemoaning Saul, and God was like, what's the matter with you? Go and do what I told you to do. And go and anoint the right person. He got corrected. Nabal was unreasonable, and his wife even named it. He's a, he was a fool, and she worked around him. She, she called him out. Mary and Joseph didn't hide their displeasure with Jesus. So how open are you to feedback? And by the way, about what does God need to yell at you? And hear me say, that is a good thing. If we really are God's children, then God will discipline us. And we should walk in that. 